sure we allow plenty of time for our feature uh, speaker. So a pleasant good day to all. Thank you so much for making hospitality first part of your morning. We're here to ensure that we deliver some great meetings with amazing topics. And towards that end, we are doing some planning on Thursday, November 5th at 11 o'clock. So if you can participate or help in planning as a number of people have, please sign up for that meeting online. Also, I'm happy to report our next Hospitality First meeting, uh, which the idea for this was generated from the planning meeting. We are gonna have Kelsey Waite, who's a business development executive with Destination Star Incorporated. For those of you who may be newer or know less about hospitality, Star is the main engine that tracks metrics from across the country for benchmarking and marketplace and analytics, understanding rev par and rate and occupancy. So we're gonna have a key person, Kelsey, give us a full presentation. So you won't wanna miss out on that. Also, Aaron Nystrom, who owns the two Potbelly sandwich shops, will give some insights as a restaurant owner in surviving and thriving beyond COVID-19. And then rounding out the year in December, Joe Ward, president of Experience Rochester, will be giving a bit of a look back and a look ahead as a full year has occurred under the new format of Mail Civic Center and Experience Rochester together as one entity. And again, where we'd love to have these events in person, right now we're still tied in with the virtual uh, train of things. So just to uh, highlight uh, some of what just transpired, uh, statistics were just released uh, this week for the month of September. As a Rochester market, we grew 2% in occupancy to 46.1% at an average daily rate of 110.26, which was up about $3 to the previous month, and a revenue per available room at $50.88, up a little over $3 uh, to the previous month. And again, uh, all these metrics are down about 30% to last year with the pandemic, but to see the numbers grow means we're definitely as a community headed in the right direction to ensure we not only recover, uh, but thrive together. As we move ahead today, uh, we are very excited to have Tiana O'Connor here. She is the Marketing and Communications Director, really the voice and face of the Rochester International Airport. Our Rochester International Airport is a key piece of bringing visitors, patients, corporate guests, and others to our city. And she's gonna tell you about some of the great updates that are happening at the airport and give you a bit of a vision about what they're doing to survive and thrive in a pandemic. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Tiana O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, all right, can everybody hear me okay so far? Okay, excellent. I'm seeing some head nods here. So um, I do have a PowerPoint for you, so I am going to share my screen. All right, so um, I will run through about probably 15 to 20 minutes of information here for you guys, and then I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that come up to um, brief touching on the history, cover the air service industry, talk about where we were at kind of pre-pandemic, um, some of the effects of the pandemic, and then I'll leave you with some good news. Um, 
So uh, the Rochester Airport history, um, some of you may know this who have been in the community for a while, but it's really uh, unique. Um, back in 1928, uh, the Mayo brothers decided to open the first airport here in Rochester as a way to bring patients to the area, um, as they knew that that would be the new preferred method of transportation. And so the first fairgrounds was built near the uh, 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 sorry, the first uh, airport was built near the uh, fairgrounds in Southeast Rochester. Um, and it was a privately held airport. So in 1945, federal grant funding became available and the airport wasn't eligible at that time. So the Mayo Foundation knew that it was in the best interest of the community to continue growing the airport. So they put into place a really unique operating agreement where the city of Rochester um, owned the Rochester airport, making it a public airport. Um, but the Rochester airport company, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Mayo Clinic, maintained management uh, of the airport. And so that agreement still exists to this day. So the airport is owned by the city of Rochester, but it is managed by the Rochester airport company, which is a subsidiary of Mayo. So it's a very unique model for operating an airport. Um, in about 1960, we moved out to the current location. Um, in 1995, the U.S. Customs Facility opened, which changed the name from Rochester Municipal Airport to Rochester International Airport. So we often get questions about that, you know, being a smaller airport, not having commercial international flights, you know, why do you have that in your name? Um, it is because of the uh, U.S. Customs Facility that we have that international designation. So a little bit of the landscape of the air service industry and, uh, you know, this is pre-pandemic. So a lot of this has changed and will continue to change. Um, but recently what we have seen is that the industry has really consolidated to four major players in the United States. Um, so Delta, American and United, which we're all familiar with as they serve our community in Southwest, those four control over 80% of the U.S. domestic capacity. Um, so as a, a community of our size, we are very lucky to have those three major airlines here in Rochester that provide network connectivity and international access. Um, a lot of people do ask us about Southwest. Um, they say, you know, are they going to come here? Um, the reality is they just don't fit um, a market like ours. Uh, they fly only 737 aircraft um, and the smallest communities that they operate in and out of are at least three to four times the size of Rochester. So um, really just not a fit at this time. Some of the challenges that we have been facing in the industry um, in the previous years here have been pilot um, shortages and aircraft um, changes. So the airlines are all uh, trying to upgauge to larger aircraft sizes. So they're pulling the 50 seat regional jets out of their fleet. And so what that means is that a community like Rochester is competing for planes and pilots, those resources against um, you know, communities all across the United States. So it's a really competitive industry. And so with that, um, we work on air service development. So um, myself and our executive director, John Reed, um, we attend industry conferences. And uh, the really interesting thing is it's essentially speed dating with airlines. So um, we attend the conferences. We uh, ahead of time request airlines to meet with. Um, the airlines choose whether they accept or decline those meetings. Um, we show up to a conference. Um, in the left hand corner there you'll see kind of the screen in the back that's actually a 20 minute timer so you sit down across the table from the airline um, and you have 20 minutes and you have to pitch the community and you know we're talking about business cases of you know supporting new flights in and out of rochester and and how that might um, be successful for them these airline planning departments only have very small staff, you know, maybe nine, 10, 12 people that are managing networks that are global. And so when we have these conversations with them, they just don't have the resources themselves to go out and find all of these unique opportunities. And so we have to go and talk with them um, about what it might be like to bring new flights to Rochester. Um, you know, I will say that oftentimes we get asked things like, well, why don't you just get a flight to here? Um, you know, the airport doesn't get to decide. It's the airlines that control, um, you know, which routes are flown and, and to where. And when we have these conversations, um, not a single question is asked about what can the airport handle. It's not about our runway length. It's not about our gate size or anything like that. Um, every single question is about the community and what you guys will support. 
support. So that's why we've spent a lot of time talking about the Fly Local initiative and how important it is. Um, because, you know, an airline isn't going to pay attention to an airport um, where people might just drive off and use services elsewhere. So um, we've had a lot of great success and growth in the past few years, and that really helps these conversations um, continue with the airlines. So where were we at um, last year, uh, pre-COVID? Um, some of our numbers from 2019, um, second busiest commercial service airport in Minnesota, serving a little over 370,000 uh, passengers, um, pretty substantial commercial um, cargo operations. So about 23 million pounds of cargo um, in and out of the facility. 53 or 50,000 uh, control tower operations. So that would be an air, uh, aircraft landing or uh, takeoff at the airport. Um, we handle usually about 200 um, diversions from MSP a year. Um, I will just footnote that we had one of those this morning. So um, some of you might have heard on the news that there was an emergency landing here in Rochester. Um, luckily, all is well. Um, passengers deplaned just fine, but um, emergency uh, crews were on hand um, just to stand by for that. Uh, Delta flight that was from uh, St. Louis into Minneapolis, but again, everybody's on the ground safe. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, and we are one of the busiest air ambulance facilities in the United States. Um, and we do clear about 200 um, international aircraft each year. And all of that equates to a really large uh, economic impact. So uh, MnDOT Office of Aeronautics did a study last year and uh, equated that to $190 million um, economic impact Jay. that RST has on the region. So um, as I mentioned, you know, the Fly Local there, Initiative. Um, you know, many of us have had um, conversations about this and we really do thank you for your support. So there's a lot of organizations that I see on here that are part of our Fly Local campaign. Um, and we appreciate the utilization of the Rochester Airport. That's really helped these numbers grow pretty dramatically. So in 2018, we had a record year of passengers. Um, and then in 2019, we really held steady uh, with that passenger traffic. Um, and then we all know that we entered 2020, um, so things began to change. Um, I will say um, that many of us uh, didn't really see this coming, of course. Um, you know, John and I were actually in Indianapolis in February at an airline conference. So the picture that I showed you before where you sit down and have the meetings with the airlines, um, we were having conversations in early February uh, about um, the outlook for Rochester. And, you know, it was a lot of conversation about growth, um, you know, talking about being on the short list, adding to flights. Um, so a lot of uh, really positive momentum that we had. And, um, you know, they would talk a little bit about how some of, you know, their counterparts in the international um, airline uh, planning side were, you know, focusing on efforts of, um, responding to the virus in Asia and the network uh, connectivity that that had an impact there. Um, but really on the domestic side, we were still having good conversations about growth. And that was about the second week of February. So then we all know um, that the world changed. Um, and in, in March, we really started to see those impacts in our industry. Um, you know, I think even before some of the very, um, you know, impactful uh, health um, changes happened within the U.S. and we really kind of started to feel this on a personal level here, um, you know, the air service industry was hit really fast because the airlines all of a sudden had to, um, you know, park planes that they hadn't been planning on, um, you know, service between entire countries was cut off and the industry really started scrambling. You know, in the beginning, people would talk about, is this, you know, what kind of impact is this? Is this worse than, you know, 9-11? Is this worse than the Great Recession? Um, and certainly months later, we can all sit and say that it's, it's definitely much, much worse. Um, it's definitely the biggest um, impact that our industry has ever seen. So we saw commercial passenger traffic just essentially drop off. Um, we had some pretty good numbers in January and February, right on track with where we had been the previous year. By about mid-March, um, a lot of travel was cut off for businesses, um, and so we dropped to about um, half of our passenger traffic. In April, um, we had kind of our rock bottom level of only 1,100 passengers uh, through the door at RST. 
And that was about 4% of what we had seen the year before. So not only on the airline side, but on other uh, services within the airport, it had a really massive impact. Um, many of them are reliant on the passengers that come through. So, um, you know, the restaurant had to um, unfortunately uh, shut down temporarily. You know, parking lot had to limit their staff on site. Um, ground transportation had to limit some operations. Um, some services were suspended to uh, passengers like the Mayo General Services staff, Skycaps, pet therapy. So we really had to just kind of um, halt a lot of operations. Um, throughout kind of the beginning of the pandemic and, and you know, um, ongoing, um, cargo operations have remained pretty steady. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, ended up just shopping online and needing those essential items, um, you know, that delivered to us. And so cargo stayed pretty steady. Um, the private aviation side did drop off for a while, um, but we have seen that um, resume quicker than the commercial aviation side. You know, and I would say that if you, you know, are needing to travel likely for medical care and if you have your own Gulfstream 5 like we show here, um, you know, you can travel and do it in a socially distanced way um, quicker than some other uh, passengers have been able to get back to. So we have continued to see those operations um, going pretty steady. So the airline response, um, you know, they had to start cutting capacity right away um, to meet the demand, that drop in demand. Uh, a few of the airlines have um, limited the amount of passengers that can be allowed on an aircraft or blocked the middle seat. Um, some notify uh, passengers if your flight is full to a certain capacity. Um, initially, they all started uh, offering travel waivers so that those that had travel impacted um, could make uh, arrangements or cancel their travel. Um, you know, one silver lining out of this is that the, that is a change that's going forward. So. Uh, you know, change fees have basically been um, eliminated within um, the major airlines. And so that's good for us as, as travelers to have that ongoing. Um, face uh, coverings have been required on flights for quite some time. Um, the airlines are all taking that very seriously. Um, I've heard from a couple peers in the industry who have been out flying that, um, you know, one in particular mentioned that he was um, taxiing uh, out to take off in Atlanta um, and a passenger removed their, their face covering. The crew asked him to put it back on. He did not. And they turned right around and went back to the gate. So they are taking those things very seriously on board, um, as well as, of course, their enhanced cleaning measures. Um, the CARES Act funding um, did help support um, payroll for the airlines through the end of September, um, but that has expired. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of layoffs, tens of thousands of layoffs happening within the industry right now. Um, the airlines are still calling for additional federal funding to try to help support the industry. Um, you know, the, the reason being that the industry is kind of a backbone to um, a recovery of the economy. And once the network begins to collapse, it's very hard to rebuild that. You can't just flip a switch and turn it back on. So, um, you know, there's a lot of shifts underway with um, layoffs and, uh, you know, routes that are being um, terminated. And so um, we'll just have to kind of see how the, the industry continues to react. Um, and then nationwide, um, one of the measures we've all been watching really closely is the uh, throughput at the checkpoints. So the TSA numbers uh, reported at the top of the screen there, you'll see the, um, the 2019 numbers um, with the red line there being the 2020 um, passenger traffic. Um, and then some of the, the numbers noted there um, with April being really that rock bottom, just as we saw in Rochester um, with a few peaks. Um, climbing back up towards the end of late summer. Um, so I do just wanna also, in full disclosure, um, let you know that timing was very interesting for me personally. Um, so I was expecting my first child um, and she was born on April 7th. So uh, as this was all kind of coming to a head, um, you know, I'm wrapping up as many things as I could as things are changing daily and we're responding to the crisis. Um, and then I, I stepped out for maternity leave and, you know, really didn't know what I would be coming back to. Um, but we'll just throw in um, that we had a healthy baby girl, uh, Isabel. So she is uh, six months old now, um, doing well. Everybody loves baby pictures and asked me for them. So I figured I'd slide them in there for you. 
Um, and as this is Minnesota, these two pictures were about 10 days apart. So, um, yeah. Uh, some of the um, initiatives, though, the reason I bring that up is that, um, you know, my colleagues worked just day in and day out to respond as quickly as possible to uh, the changes in the industry and how that meant that we needed to operate in Rochester. So um, I just pass along a ton of kudos to them that, um, you know, they started putting things in place right away, like you know, sanitizer, enhanced cleaning measures. Um, we had plexiglass barriers installed at all of the person-to-person -person contact points, um, you know, floor decals in place to note social distancing, face masks were required even before the city and state requirements came into place. So um, they began taking the health and safety measures very um, seriously, and those are all still in place to this day. And as time has gone on, um, some new information has emerged uh, about um, flying during the pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of have the perception that if you're in an aircraft, that air is just cycling around and, you know, it might not be the safest. Um, but uh, HEPA, HEPA filters are actually on board every aircraft. And so those are essentially hospital grade uh, air filtration systems. And they do cycle in fresh air. And the way that the um, air circulates, it's really just within your row instead of flying all throughout the cabin. And so if all passengers are masked, um, one of the most recent stats that came out is that the risk of transmission is 0.003% um, on the aircraft. So, um, you know, if you pack the appropriate um, safety uh, items with you, and um, of course, follow the same guidelines you would as anywhere, don't go out if you're sick, you know, wash your hands, use sanitizer, um, you really can travel safely um, if you would like to or if you need to at this time. So um, where we're at right now is, um, luckily, we've had some good news um, in, in Rochester. So. Um, many of you are probably aware that we have a new uh, nonstop Denver flight. Um, so we were really, really grateful that this got started, um, even in the midst of a pandemic. So um, as I mentioned, you know, going to those airline conferences, this is a, a route that we've been working on for years. Um, and it really took the community supporting the airport, um, continuing to fly local, that helped us recruit that service. And so um, that flight started on October 1st. Um, it is daily um, in and out of Rochester to Denver. Um, it's doing pretty well so far. Um, honestly, with the pandemic, it's been about 60% full. Um, and, you know, that's, that's pretty strong right now. Um, you know, we do expect it to grow as people get back to travel um, more frequently. Um, as of right now, it's a really good location for, you know, if you are looking for a place to safely get out and, um, you know, vacation with your family, you know, you can get to Denver, you can explore the outdoors of Colorado. So um, it's great for that in itself as a destination. Um, and it also provides access to over 70 cities to the west. So it's a really great connection point for our community to have that uh, service out to the west. And um, in particular right now, the vast majority of passengers that we're seeing are patient travelers. So this really allows those patients to be able to flow into Rochester easier um, by connecting through the Denver hub uh, from a western destination. So we have seen the passenger numbers continue to um, increase uh, each month since April. Um, so we are back to about 25 to 30 percent of passenger traffic of uh, the previous year, which is about on track with the industry right now, just a little bit below. Um, our Mayo General Services staff have returned. Our Skycaps um, will be returning on November 1st. Um, ground transportation has increased offerings available, and then our restaurant reopened. In November, we'll have one flight a day to Chicago on American, four to Minneapolis on Delta. Um, Atlanta is still currently suspended. Um, we do believe it'll come back. Um, we just don't have a timeline in, um, from the airline yet at this time. Um, and then United, twice a day to Chicago and uh, once a day to Denver. We do have a new restaurant operator um, in the airport. They took over on February 1st. Um, the, the operator is Tailwind Concessions. They operate at about 25 airport locations across the country at like-size facilities. So they really are kind of the experts um, in this space in being able to offer um, you know, food, beverage, and retail to passengers. Um, they did have to temporarily shut down um, 
but now that passenger traffic has begun to increase again, they have been able to, to reopen. Um, so we do uh, expect them to continue increasing their offerings available. Um, and then we do anticipate a remodel of the space in the future too. So they came in, um, you know, obviously right before the pandemic, some of the work that they put into place right away um, was some new service locations in the upper level gate areas. So if you're familiar with the airport, we've got kind of the main level just past the security checkpoint and then two upper level gates on either end. So you will now be able to have, or I'm sorry, eventually once their services are expanded again, you'll be able to have food and beverage up in the gate area. Areas. Um, so that's a great service for our passengers that like to get up to the gate. Um, in the meantime, those services will just be available in the main restaurant location on the, on the main floor. Um, some other excellent news. Um, last week, we were able to celebrate the bonding bill um, coming through. Um, so we were able to uh, secure $11.4 million from the state, um, which is uh, what was needed in order to move forward with our uh, nearly $80 million project. Um, so this will reconstruct uh, runway 220, which is at the end of its useful life. And then we'll also reconstruct the intersection and then some of the associated um, landing instrument um, systems along with this. So it's gonna be a really massive project, um, likely six to seven years. Um, we'll get started with that in um, spring of 2021. Um, another uh, fun opportunity we have coming up is, you know, we have a lot of space in our parking lot right now. Um, so we wanted to offer a community event for Halloween for a lot of families that it might not look um, like they would have hoped. And so um, this would be a safe event um, outdoors. Um, we're just going to have some of our airport equipment on display. We'll have items, um, you know, giveaways for, for kids to pick up. We'll stay socially distanced the whole time, um, but that'll be from three to four on Halloween. Um, we do have that out on our Facebook page, um, and if you wanted to take a look at that, if your families are interested, um, just make sure you, you know, click that you're interested or going on the, the Facebook event, because if we do have any updates regarding kind of any changing health measures um, or any weather impacts, that is where we would update folks. Um, about that event, but we're looking forward to that. It'll be a fun way to connect with the community. So that is everything I have for you guys within kind of the PowerPoint, but um, I will answer any questions that you might have as well. Tian, as far as displays of art or other things at the airport, are there plans to do further incorporation of that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So early this year, we started a program um, called Arts Elevated at RST, and we did that in partnership with the Greater Rochester Arts and Cultural Trust. Um, so we displayed a little over 20 um, pieces of artwork throughout the terminal building um, with the ability to have those uh, for sale to the passengers that are moving through. Um, we had intentions of rotating that exhibit about every six months and putting out a call for art for new um, art to come into the space. You know, with the downturn in passengers, we've offered for those artists to stay in place um, basically indefinitely, you know, until we really see um, more folks coming through the door that we would warrant kind of a, a change of that. We've had a few pieces sell, which is really awesome. These are all local and regional artists that are on display. So the the opportunity for some of them to be able to, to get those, um, you know, their art displayed and then also sell it is really great. Hey, Tiana, um, Kim Purcell, and I live in Owatonna. I'm just wondering, how are you marketing the new service um, to Denver? That's fascinating. And being there's no travel agencies typically booking travel anymore, how are you marketing to the general public? Yep, so um, it, it has changed a little bit for us. Um, we typically would come out with a lot of fun community events, travel promotions, things like that. Um, but we do really want to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, some people might not want to be thinking about travel right now. Um, so we've had to, you know, kind of constrain ourselves a little bit um, with our messaging. Um, but we do need to make sure that people are aware of it as well. So um, we do place advertising throughout the region um, to let people know that the Denver flight is available. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who do have essential travel needs right now too, um, getting back to connecting with family um, or moving uh, for some essential business. Um, so we are, you know, doing different um, platforms of advertising throughout the region.
Deanna, when they refer to airline industry funding and support, who gets the money? The big four uh, and the airports or? Yeah, um, there's, it's distributed, um, I guess I'd say based on kind of volume. Um, so the airport itself, we were recipients of some CARES Act funding, um, which was really critical for us to be able to maintain our staff and, you know, all of the safety requirements that we have in operating the airport. Um, so we do have that CARES Act funding that we received as an airport, um, and then that is all based on our um, passenger traffic and size of airport. Um, and then the airlines as well um, have been recipients of funding. So, um, you know, getting into the specifics of how that was divided for the airlines, I don't know that uh, myself. Um, but, you know, obviously those larger airlines would have been, you know, recipients of more than maybe some of the smaller carriers. Do we, uh, as, a Rod as the Rochester Airport, do you receive any funding? for the amount of military practice that comes in and out of the airport? Yeah, um, there is an agreement um, with some, um, you know, financial obligations to it for the um, National Air Guard operations that come through um, because they are um, operating on a, a frequent basis, I guess I would say. So they have the ability to come in and um, use our facility. I would say though too, the interesting thing is that any um, airport that accepts federal grant money um, has to remain publicly available um, and allow the military to operate at any time. So we do have an agreement with those users that come um, frequently, you know, like the C-130s that we see throughout Rochester that come down and kind of do their touch and goes and circle around the community. Um, but, you know, if any other um, aircraft that we're not used to typically seeing come, um, we do have to allow those to operate. Hey, Tiana. Uh, so uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit. You mentioned that the airline was at about 20 five percent capacity um, a little below maybe national average but you guys have also received funding so do you feel that the airline is on track to recover um that that the airport is on track to recover or yes airport excuse me sure yep just want to make sure i was answering appropriately yeah you know i mean all signs are pointing to a recovery for us in terms of just making sure that we are um responding appropriately. So, you know, when we talk about things like the restaurant um, closing down for some time, we needed to do that in order for them to be able to stay in our market um, ongoing. So we work with them and, you know, during the time that they were shut down, we were able to provide just water and a few small snacks to passengers so that they had something available. Um, but then we monitor the passenger traffic and when it's going to be financially feasible for them to, to begin operating again, you know, we have those conversations and we help them get uh, restarted at the airport. So that's kind of how we're managing a lot of this is, you know, cutting expenses where we need to and then working with our partners to really kind of match their services to the passenger increases. Um, because we do want to make sure that we're um, recovering um, in a really smart way. Dan, is there another particular uh, sister airport that we most uh, look up to or try to mirror their actions and trends in order to be better? Um, that's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, we do ponder that because, um, you know, we need to be able to um, kind of measure ourselves and yet we are a very unique airport. You know, you look at airports of our size, um, they may not have a customs facility where they're accepting large international aircraft. They might have people, you know, a, a smaller airport might only be, you know, a small amount of business travelers that are going outbound. Um, but we are, for a community of our size, um, just as much a destination as we are in having uh, passengers depart from our local airport. And we're serving the needs of very unique passenger population, the patient travelers. You know, so when we look at things that we do at the Rochester Airport, for an airport of our size, you know, we have the quiet rooms available for patient travelers, we have the Mayo General Services employees on site, we have um, the Skycap services to assist with wheelchairs. You know, all of those things are kind of catering to a little bit different um, 
passenger group than other airports of our size would be. Um, you know, we do know that there's a large um, hub airport up the road that people, um, you know, often kind of draw those comparisons. You know, certainly we're not going to ever outgrow, um, you know, MSP. Um, they're always going to have more offerings in terms of their, um, you know, size or frequency. Um, but what we can do is offer that convenient, easy experience, so the ability to not have to drive, um, and then kind of that personal um, touch that we can offer in Rochester. So um, we do always um, measure ourselves against other airports, but I don't know that there's any equivalent to us. I have to say, uh, in my earlier years in my career, I did a great deal of flying for my business and my job. And uh, this airport was very, uh, very friendly for that. It was, uh, you know, if you, do, if you don't have to go to one of those big major airports, it's a lot more relaxing, a lot easier flying. So Rochester always did a really great job back in those days. And I think with the Mayo Clinic here, we'll always have, a, uh, there, there's always going to be a need, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, I think many of you, you know, this is a hospitality group. You would all appreciate that. The fact that, you know, you might have counterparts in your industry that you, um, you know, check in with or, you know, best practices that you try to follow, um, but that you know that you're serving a different need. You know, somebody isn't necessarily coming to town just for a, a wedding or a convention, you know, they might be coming with, you know, really heavy medical concerns on their mind. And so that just puts all of us in the time, um, mind frame of kind of taking care of those patient travelers in a, in a different way. Tiana, in marketing the uh, airport, can you highlight some of the uh, cost savings that an individual passenger would experience in time to go through a checkpoint and in gas or other savings, ticket savings from your perspective? Yeah, so what we have found is that in the past few years um, with increased competition, so that would have been when United Airlines came into the market in 2017, um, you know, the airfare has really dropped pretty significantly. Um, from 2017 to 19, it had dropped about 13%. Um, so the airfare is becoming uh, much more comparable. And then of course, um, you know, one of the items we always talk about is comparing that true cost of travel. So um, actually out on our website, um, right on our homepage, there's a calculator you can use. So if you're weighing your options and you're looking at um, two departing flights, and you can key in the um, airfare um, from two different competing airports. Um, you can uh, you know, put in if you'd be parking, the amount of days that you'd be parking, um, it'll calculate gas for you. Um, you can adjust those to any numbers that you want, but I think that once you take a look at that, you'll see that pretty quickly it adds up that um, you know, the Rochester Airport is, is a really competitive offering. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, from I see a chat from Dan. Um, yes, uh, business can, businesses can definitely still sign up um, to be a part of our Fly Local initiative. Um, we'll keep that list ongoing. Um, you know, we talk with those businesses about continuing to utilize the airport, um, you know, informing them of the new Denver flight and the connectivity options that that provides. Um, so it's as easy as just sending me an email and I can connect with you on that, um, tell you a little bit more. Um, there's really no requirement in terms of um, company size or number of trips a year or anything like that. Um, it's really just us being able to educate you about the importance of using the airport, um, talking about some of those things like the cost calculation, you know, when you've got to put an employee on the road that you might be needing to pay a mileage reimbursement to um, or additional time on the road, you know, those are things to take into consideration as a business owner um, and, you know, what that cost of travel is for you. So um, feel free, reach out um, and I can share more with you and then we'll get you added to our list of Fly Local supporters. Deanna, uh, this is Nancy Peterson, and um, uh, I just want to um, commend you for the 
um, event that you're doing with the, the you know, breaking out and, and um, having community members come there. Um, I just want to ask some questions about um, um, incorporating into the education piece, um, you know, with Zoom and everything else, if you've considered, um, you know, for Boy Scouts, you know, being an avenue um, to say how that you're working through the pandemic and how you can use it to educate others of what you do and go into careers for that. Um, during this time, um, and also um, um, uh, working out into the community, your transportation and doing the hospitality um, to get to different events and businesses um, from the people that are coming here. Um, um, how is that working for you? Or what are some of the channels that you have uh, to get that hospitality out for community hospitality um, in reopening and reforming, um, uh, getting businesses going? Yeah, so I think from the educational standpoint, um, we're always open to those opportunities. Um, you know, in the past, we've had groups come out um, to the airport and take a tour. Um, we've gone to um, classrooms and done presentations um, talking about getting into the, the airline uh, air service industry. So we're always open to that. And of course, you know, in the, the given circumstances, you know, we might have to pivot and do those throughout kind of a virtual environment. So that would be fine as well. Um, in terms of, you know, the hospitality side, you know, we um, are aligned with the Rochester Ready Initiative. And so, um, you know, making sure that, you know, people understand that we are a safe environment, just as though many of you are with your locations, um, so that when they come to town, they know that they can expect, um, you know, a safe location um, and that they, you know, the making sure that they're aware of things like our mask requirement. You know, we have signage up within the, the facility so that those arriving passengers um, will know that once they arrive. Yeah, and you mentioned that, but as far as having a list, when people come providing lists of um, what restaurants are open or to what extent, um, that type of thing where we're doing hospitality out into the business again, or the community. Um, sure. And the transportation that's provided within the community because of the limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do, um, we have one of the um, kiosks um, supported by Experience Rochester. So that is available in our um, baggage claim area. So people can access information there. Um, and then our Mayo um, General Services staff and then the Skycaps when they return, um, they're really great at providing community information um, to people that are arriving in Rochester. Um, and then the ground transportation, we do have, you know, the, the shuttles, limos, um, available uh, taxis um, from right at the airport. And then Uber and Lyft are, of course, welcome to operate at, at Rochester, too. So, you know, all of those services still are in place. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Tiana, I kind of have an overarching news question. Um, you know, as far as this being kind of connecting hospitality and the airport, how important is that relationship? And how important are hospitality and the airport and airlines to making sure that the economy and downtown Rochester really thrive? Yeah, so, um, you know, the vast majority of passengers that we're serving right now are those visitors because they are inbound patient travelers. Um, you know, they have an essential need to arrive in Rochester for their uh, medical care. And so, you know, without those folks arriving, um, we'd have very little passengers right now because not as many people, you know, many businesses have not returned to travel. Um, so we're not seeing our local passengers departing um, or returning to travel as, as much as the inbound patient travelers. So, you know, I think, um, you know, having an opportunity like this, being able to come and inform you all of the initiatives that we're working on and kind of where, what our status is, um, is really important. Um, and, you know, you all are serving the same people that, that we are, um, you know, when they arrive in Rochester, um, you know, as a visitor, they obviously need a place to stay. They need places to, to eat and be taken care of too. So being aligned with the hospitality industry is really important for us. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tiana, for your comments and your expertise. We wish you continued success and may RST grow and thrive. Thank you, Andy. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, moving right along uh, so that we can uh, hear kind of what's happening in Rochester, uh, Mr. Nick Landry 
who is our senior national sales manager with Experience Rochester, is on the line. Uh, take it away, Nick. Sure. Thank you very much, Andy. So a continuation of last month, um, I mentioned that we are focusing our efforts on prospecting and then securing the 2021 business. I uh, wanted to give an update with some numbers on those, those two metrics there. On our uh, prospecting efforts over the past couple months, um, we've been able to make 295 uh, outbound prospecting calls. Um, and we were of those calls, we were able to add in 51 new prospects to the funnel or um, organizations that hadn't previously considered Rochester um, now start considering Rochester. And we've already seen seven uh, leads come from those efforts. Uh, so exciting to see that uh, kind of turn around as we move from the triage of the early and mid pandemic um, up until now to um, getting a, a chance to focus on that prospecting effort. Um, as far as 2021 goes, um, we've got about 66 events that are in a holding pattern that still aren't uh, necessarily ready to um, start start uh, talking about what it will look like to host the event. Um, they, they just prefer to kind of um, wait and see how it's going to play out. Um, but we do have 26 events that are actively engaging us in um, developing plans as to how um, their events are going to look, um, as well as our, our confirmed events. Um, so excited to see that um, on the sales front. Uh, in other news, uh, we are finalizing the uh, search for a marketing position. Uh, so very excited to get somebody uh, back in that role as other organizations we have contracted during the pandemic to be, remain fiscally responsible, but um, have deemed it's, it's time to um, move forward and hire a marketing representative. So excited to see that. Um, so that's kind of a, a sub synopsis, Andy, of uh, where we're at. And thank you very much for the uh, time today. Excellent. Thank you. And then, Nick, just one other question uh, as it relates to uh, Jehovah's Witness, since that traditionally has been one of the larger uh, convention groups. Um, any further updates on that particular group? Yeah, so on that particular group, we did submit the uh, the way that that process works is that um, they we have a, a local body um, that plans here locally, um, but primarily the decisions are made out of the home office uh, in New York. So as of right now, um, the home office in New York is still um, considering whether or not to move forward in 2021, whether or not they're going to hold conventions around the country. They do have um, a strong emphasis on, on life, and it's something that's e extremely important to all of us. So uh, they have not indicated one way or another um, which uh, direction that they're headed. Thank you for that update. Nate, greatly Andy, appreciate it. Yes. Andy, uh, I, I want to quick chime in on uh, what I hear about the Civic Center's uh, team being uh, cooperative and kind of creative and case in point the big early bird basketball tournament uh stewartville venue wasn't available civic center creative team uh they're laying down courts as we speak and uh the courts are going to be repurposed for practice facilities for local teams as long as we got it down let's use it so uh hats off nick and the team uh don't hear the bickering of Civic Center and, and Rochester Sports or, or experience, you know, it's, uh, you're all working together. Keep it going. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, I know myself and Jeremiah's on the call for um, laying down courts last week. Uh, we did also form a, a partnership with um, uh, Rochester Sports um, so that we can work more closely with them and excited to um, explore that relationship and um, help them bring some additional sporting groups to R Rochester. Um, I, do, I would like to mention, Nancy Peterson, I would like to mention, um, because I work with the, the, uh, the Sharpa and the tourism that we talked about at our last meeting, our planning meeting, and I found out that uh, Bicycle Sports sold out of all their bicycles this past season. And um, uh, uh, Tyrell Ski and Sports sold out of all their kayaks. 
And now um, Tyrell Sports is um, saying that all their cross country skis are going. And so we're really doing a good job of, you know, getting people here and, and utilizing our small businesses, but getting out and touring uh, Minnesota. And so, um, and spending time with families um, in their free time. So um, that, that's going really well. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate the feedback. Uh, one of the cornerstones of hospitality is outstanding service. And certainly we as a hospitality community throughout Rochester have a number of stories that we can share and showcase that help to really exemplify what we do to go the extra mile for guests every day. And I think especially in this time of the pandemic, that really makes a difference. And I just wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize John from our team, uh, who was recognized by Jeff and Vicki, a guest from Tennessee, since all 50 states are really represented as the framework of what we get to welcome in Rochester. And they uh, showed extreme appreciation for his hard work, for his door-to-door -door service, even in the midst of snow and ice and wind and rain described him as such a blessing, recognized him for giving them a rosary since he knew they were uh, affiliated with the Catholic faith. And the guest who was really on his last leg is now better because of the encouragement and uplift that John provided them. And Jeff had sent uh, a picture of a big smile uh, to the hotel and expressed his warmest blessings. So each of you has your own story to tell. Don't forget, we are all treated as special blessings by guests and help them in our own unique way. And sometimes a warm embrace with a mask and social distancing, but with the right words can make all the difference. So if you have a story to tell, please let me know as we will rotate this through our entire hospitality community. I just wanna mention one other thing in working with um, the City for Good, in working with the uh, Together Greater Rochester Area COVID-19 uh, recovery and reform piece. Um, and we have discussed um, that we are going to be serving as example uh, through the DMC and through um, uh, Med City, that we were going to wear masks and serve as examples um, to uh, meet the requirements for safety, sanitation, prevention, and getting our businesses back. And I just want to commend our group and uh, Rochester Med City Rural to the Capitol that we are leading in that. And you heard the example today, but I'm working um, through the state with ARPA, through the City for Good, and they are just, they're releasing. Um, Rochester to open up the facilities even more for the elderly. Um, and so that is really, and, and we can't super exceed 10% um, and we're at 4%. So I'm just saying we're doing a good job and I commend this group for being leaders for the state of Minnesota. And not only that, Wisconsin is really struggling with this now in education and in the medical, uh, everything. And we're, we're Thank leading, you for sharing that. We appreciate we're leading, that. We're leading as examples through the university system. So thank you. All right. Uh, moving right along, certainly humor is an igniter of brightness, of happiness in others. And here to showcase a bit of humor, Dan Nelson from Platinum Experience Consulting. Okay, a quick uh, Zoom poll. How many of you are wearing sweatpants, yoga pants, or similar? Admit, I am. I am. <laughs> All right, I, today I had a breakthrough. I got a tie and sweatpants on. I never done that before. <laughs> Take it away, Andy. Thank you. I believe that our mayor is still on, and I will double check that. 
Mayor Norton, are you still on yet? This is Terry from City Administration. The mayor is uh, just, I think, jumped off. She's going to be on another call here. All right. Terry, do you want to go ahead and highlight some of about what we're doing right now in the special Spirit Day promotion in Rochester? You know, in all honesty, I don't have a whole lot of information, uh, Andy. Um, um, the only thing that I've been mostly involved in lately is we've been working to, you know, provide for, you know, the winter outdoor dining downtown. Well, actually throughout the city, I should say. Um, and uh, we, we set up a one-stop shop, so to speak, last week for permitting. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, activity that particular day, but it did sound like we had some restaurants that are, you know, interested in setting up, you know, temporary structures over the winter months. And um, so they'll be working with our building safety and fire fire teams, you know, to make sure that, you know, all the safety requirements are met there. Uh, and then our public works team, I think, um, for the restaurants that won't be, or yeah, won't be um, utilizing the, the winter service, they'll go in and um, start moving some of the barriers, uh, Jersey barriers uh, out of the uh, in front of those restaurant spaces here in, um, I think November 13th is the, the date I believe they want to do that. And we just recently, or this week, our parks folks have went to some of the restaurants where we loaned out some of the picnic tables uh, and they're bringing them back now for the winter. But we have been telling and trying to get the message out along with our partners, you know, at the RDA and whatnot that, you know, uh, if, if things um, are still somewhat in flux come spring, you know, we're going to be more than willing to continue, you know, with what we're doing in regard to use of public right of way for, um, you know, that, that space for restaurant tables and, uh, and that sort of thing. So we're going to continue to work with our, um, you know, business community to try and help uh, as best we can. That's outstanding. Thank you for sharing that. And of the some 500 plus restaurants we have in our community, <clears throat> about how many are participating in that expanded dining plan? Well, right now I only know of, you know, a handful of them or that have expressed interest. It's, it's not been a large number. Um, you know, some of them I think are still kind of contemplating it and trying to figure out, you know, whether it, you know, in terms of, you know, if they've got to go and rent tents and things like that, if it's worth it to them and, and whatnot. But I think if they're going to do it, it's something that, you know, they'd have to kind of make decisions on fairly quickly just in order to get equipment and those materials ordered and set up before we get more bad weather than what we've already had. Right, right. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. On the uh, national front, I just want to share that the occupancy forecast for the United States is 47.7%. Uh, we just experienced as a community the 46.1%. So we are right on par with what's happening across America. Now remember again, next month's meeting is going to be framed by the STAR trends and tactics, uh, as well as a presentation uh, about pop belly sandwich shops and the small business role that they play in our community and so many other businesses play. So again, uh, we're fine tuning the programming to meet your needs. If you have suggestions, please participate in the November 5th planning meeting at 11 a.m. Uh, you can sign up on the Rochester MN Chamber uh, website. For the good of all, any additional announcements that we have overlooked? I just want to comment on uh, philanthropy and nonprofits in conjunction with uh, Tiana, what she had. Um, we have uh, United Way on the 31st and for families um, uh, and Evangel United Methodist Church that are having um, drive-by trunk or treating. Uh, for families in the faith community and in uh, United with United Way for our nonprofits. And then also to report um, what the landing is doing with uh, Dan. Um, they've just had a, um, a fundraiser to prepare for 
um, homelessness and, and all they're doing uh, for the community. It's just awesome uh, for homelessness now with the cold weather coming on and um, the increase of people that'll be homeless because of businesses lost and, and the pandemic and stuff. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Andy, a quickie on the Chamber's Great Shop Local program. Uh, kickoff tomorrow, 2 o'clock, register, uh, get in there. Uh, you know, now more than ever, we got to shop local the next few months. That's absolutely critical because our business helps to sustain businesses throughout our city, for sure. Thank you all for listening and contributing. And from our house to yours, have a great week, and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you. Andy Telges at the Home Too Sweet. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andy, for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you. Everybody have a good October. You too. Thank you. Happy Friday Eve. You as well, Ron. <laughs>